Nat. Um, so Nat completed her bachelor's and honors in Perth. And um, since then, she spent a couple of years in Papua New Guinea working on sea turtle um, conservation and management and has done some other consulting work. Um, and today we'll hear about her PhD. She's, she's been here for about a year and a half. So maybe she has some data to show us. I don't know. Uh, we're going to hear about her PhD on um, sea turtles. And do we have that? Yeah. Thanks. It's all for now. Let's see, is this on? Yeah, it's moving. All right. So this is basically a bit of an overview of my PhD and kind of what I've collected so far. So I'll just go through. I've got quite a few super supervisors from CDU around Australia, so I'm not going to go through all of those, but you can have a look there. And my PhD is on the habitat use and of habitat use and genetics actually of foraging green turtles in the Northern Territory. Cool. So for those of you who aren't um, in the marine space and turtle experts, I'll just go through a little bit about the turtle life cycle and how that works because it's quite important to kind of understand the reasoning behind my PhD. So turtles come up onto their nesting beaches, like these ones here, um, lay their eggs. They'll stay there for about three months. They'll lay eggs every two weeks usually. Um, when the eggs hatch, hatchlings come out, takes about two months, hatchlings come out and they go offshore into a period that's called the lost years. When they're about 15 years old, 15 to 20, they'll come back on, or 10 to 15, they'll come back into some foraging areas. They'll find a spot that seems nice and they'll sit there and they'll eat and they'll grow until they reach about 50 years old. And then they'll travel all the way back to their nesting beach where they were born to lay their eggs again. Um, we think males also do the same thing. They'll return back to where they were born to mate and then go back, but there's not a lot of evidence of that at the moment. Um, the nesting females, once they're finished, they'll also go back to their foraging ground. And it's been proven they have very strong fidelity to both their nesting ground and the foraging ground. Um, which means that if you're looking at turtles on a foraging reef, they're made up of turtles from all different areas. Um, so if you're treating foraging turtles and nesting turtles, you have to study them quite differently. So just as an example, this is a bunch of data I've recently been given access to. This has been given to me from Woodside, Impex and um, Pendoli Environmental. So this is a bunch of turtle tracks, uh, mostly from nesting females and a couple of males that we tagged at Kapadu um, that were yeah, tagged at nesting beaches in WA and came through Northern Territory waters. So these are just the Northern Territory ones. I don't have included the ones that went everywhere else. Um, but as you can see, um, they travel from the nesting beaches and go to foraging grounds within the Northern Territory. Our two males here went the same thing, went out to a nesting beach and then came back to their, their foraging ground. So they undergo quite long migrations when they do this. So for my PhD, I've got my focus is on the foraging turtles in the Northern Territory. And my main sites that we've been to have been Field Island in Kakadu, uh, Trepan Bay at Ngaragadakbalu Marine Park at Coburg Peninsula, and Marchambar Island at the Wessel Islands. So my research chapters, um, my first chapter is inferring migration routes through uh, whole mitochondrial DNA sequencing of two uh, key green turtle foraging, um, foraging areas. Um, chapter two is defining the habitats used by foraging green turtles in the top end. Uh, chapter three is looking at the fine scale habitat use and diet of, green, of foraging green turtles. And finally, integrating expert knowledge into a spatially explicit risk assessment of green turtles in the Northern Territory. So instead of describing how I collect this data in the field, I'm going to show a little video. So there's a reason that most of the data has been collected on nesting turtles, and that is because they are so much easier to find. You can come up onto the beach every, every year or every two to five years. Um, Foraging turtles, you have to catch them in the water, and especially if you're trying to capture males, which is we're kind of trying to focus on if we can. So I'll just play a little video. This is 
the trip up at um, Coburg from Mates. That's pretty difficult when you pretty clear command conditions and um, we only jump on when we see the bottom. So for our genetic sampling, the main two sites I'm focusing on is um, Field Island and Coburg. You can see why based on the number of samples we've been able to collect. So we've got 43 free internal samples from Coburg and 40 from Field Island. We've got a couple of hawk spills from each as well. Um, we've managed to get a few from Croker, the Darwin region and the Wessel Islands as well, but we've really struggled to catch enough turtles in those areas. So we're just kind of focusing on, on Coburg and Field Island. Um, we've also recently found out that the Golden Island Rangers collected a few samples for us this week as well, which they're going to send to us, which is really awesome. Um, so the way we're analysing these, this is the existing nesting green turtle genetic stocks, and that's been developed using control region of mitochondrial DNA. Um, there's a project at the moment that's trying to use whole mitochondrial genome sequencing to try and break up some of those genetic stocks. Um, so for my foraging turtles, that's how I'm analysing mine as well. So we're using the whole mitochondrial um, genome sequencing and trying to identify the natal origin of the turtle, the foraging turtles, and using mixed stock analysis to get a proportion of different genetic stocks contributing to each foraging ground. And that will give us an indication of migration routes because they will return to where they were born every two to five years. We've also had a, a previous study that was done in 2010, which did... Um, collected genetic samples from Coburg and Field Island um, of green turtles. And they just use the control region sequencing, but there's a chance um, we might be able to reanalyze those samples using our methods and compare those proportions over time and see if there's been a change in um, contribution for different nesting stocks. So for the habitat mapping, as you saw, I've got my little GoPro frame that I've put together. Um, so we do five minute tows at set transects. So I've selected um, randomly assigned transect points and stratified by depth. This is a bit of an old map, it's been updated the more turtles that we've tagged. Um, and then go along, do five meter, five minute transects, and then take screenshots from the, the transect and analyze those per, per percent cover of different, um, different species. So these are the ones that I've analyzed so far. Um, so just an example, some of the water clarity is not great, um, <laughs> particularly at Field Island. Um, so we've got this, this site in particular, you've got the plume from the South Alligator coming out right next to it. Um, but as you can see, you can still kind of get a bit out of it. Down to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, I can't really see what I'm doing. <laughs> Oh, 
but even though it's murky water, you can still kind of get a good idea of the, the habitat type so down there. This is only 1.6 meters. Is there coral surviving in that murky water? <laughs> um, this is at Coburg. Again, just the ones that I've analyzed so far. Um, so much clearer water out there. Um, so this one was at 5.6 meters. Um, we've got a nice seagrass meadow, pretty dense seagrass of um, Halepla rivalis, which is a, a popular turtle species. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite sites, so I thought I'd show, show it as well. So this is um, Jensen Bay at the Wessel Islands um, in Marchambar Island. Um, so this was 15 meters, it's one of the deepest transects that we've done. Um, so I had no idea what the camera was, was doing. I was just trying to make sure it didn't get stuck. Uh, to see. So this is a beautiful rocky um, habitat with lots of soft tunnels and lots of reef fish as well. And then some pretty strong currents out there as well. Got some pretty nice, pretty healthy habitats out there, which is pretty cool. Um, so these are the, the satellite tagged turtles that we've got, and the way that we're using these is overlaying their utilization densities on top of the habitat map I'm creating, and looking at um, whether there's any significant um, significant relationships between the habitat and their utilization density. Um, so this is just a bit of an overview of the turtles. We've got seven tagged at Field Island and seven at Coburg. And then we've got three greens at the Wessels. And we've got two Hawksbills that we tagged around Darwin. And then a uh, Hawksville, male Hawksville that we tagged at Coburg. So six um, of the turtles at Field Island and Coburg were males, um, which was pretty, pretty exciting to get that many. Um, it is quite difficult. Like we'll catch about 10 females before we get a male. <laughs> Um, so kind of hedging your bets, whether you hold out, put the satellite tag on a male or, or give up and put it on a female. Um, but we have had pretty good luck getting, getting those tags out. So for Field Island, this is the, their core foraging activity space. Um, so 50% county utilization density. Um, their foraging areas range from about one to six square kilometers and they're using quite small concentrated areas, particularly at that northwest side of the island. Um, there was a bit of overlap between a couple of the turtles, which was about 67%, but majority of them were quite, using quite separate areas. And then we had two, like I was talking earlier, two males that were tagged at Field Island did this nice migration, return migration, which was pretty cool. One of the first times a male turtle has ever been recorded doing a return migration uh, in the world. <laughs> so it was very exciting for us. Um, they went to two separate genetic stocks, so when I finish running the DNA, we'll be able to prove whether they went back to where they were born or not. Um, they left about two weeks from each other and travelled. One went to Scott Reef and the other one went to Camden Sound in WA. They stayed there for about a month and then they travelled back to Field Island and they went back to the exact same spot on the reef that we caught them from. That was pretty, pretty cool. So Coburg, as you can see, the foraging areas for the turtles are quite scattered compared to Field Island. Um, they're not really concentrated in one area. They're using quite a large area. So their areas ranged from about 10 to 14 square kilometers uh, with very little overlap between each turtle. So one of my questions, I guess, with the habitat map is why are they using their areas so differently compared to the Field Island turtles? And is it because of the available habitat and their diet? So that brings me to the, the diet analysis. So we've recently started using clinical swabs and doing eDNA beta barcoding to identify the diet of these foraging turtles. So green turtles usually tend to specialise in either seagrass or algae, um, and they don't tend to, to mix the two very much. Um, and that has a big implication towards their growth rate and that sort of thing. Um, so we've got 18 samples from Coburg so far and six from Kakadu. Got two more trips this year to get a few more of those samples. Um, we sent those samples off already to EnviroDNA. Um, and that will give us a list of um, the species that they're consuming. 
So my risk assessment chapter. Um, so this is my hazard assessment. This is just a, a rough, some rough maps at the moment. Um, we've got kind of our, our threats, our hazards to um, habitat. So um, sea level temperature, the sea temperatures um, in particular. So that's kind of over a whole year, the cumulative um, bleaching alert, which is when there's been anomalies over seven days based on the, sat the satellite um, temperatures from NOAA. Um, so that's, yeah, kind of shows you where, which areas are most at risk from, from habitat loss. And then we've got um, shipping density um, across the NT. So just classified it as low, medium and high. Uh, these are just two kilometer square grids. They're pretty low resolution. Um, but just looking at where those, particularly these shipping lanes, interact with turtle migration routes or um, foraging areas. So to give you an idea, these are all of those turtles from WA and Dow turtles from the NT. Um, and I've classified it as either migrating or foraging, foraging behaviour. So it gives you a good idea of where the key foraging areas are across the NT. Um, so particularly around Coburg and the Tiwis is pretty important. And also these migration routes along here, which you can see as well. That's 26 turtles that I've gotten there. I'm still adding in a few more. And then I recently got access to this data from Impex, which is a um, four turtles. One of them only had about nine data points, um, but I've just combined them here um, and just roughly put this together yesterday because I only just got the data, so I've processed it properly. Um, but you can kind of see where how they're using the areas around Darwin Harbour, um, near Channel Island and Middle Arm. So the last part of my, so this is kind of part of the exposure assessment. So looking at where, um, where those threats intersect with the turtle areas. Probably already said that, but um, the next part is the vulnerability assessment. So the way I'm doing that is looking at, um, there's not much information really about how these impacts are, how these hazards are affecting turtles, particularly in these really remote areas. So I'm using expert opinion surveys and I'm treating the Indigenous rangers and traditional owners as experts in their area. So I'm going to be doing uh, verbal surveys with the rangers to rank the different threats to turtles in their area. Um, so I've got like a survey guide like this one here um, and the rangers will go through and just rank how regularly they see these kind of hazards in their area and how often, how big of, a, how big of an impact they, they think that those hazards are having. And these are all of our project partners um, for this. So we've got about eight different ranger groups that we're working with at the moment, as well as um, supervisors from Ames, Taronga, and then some support from Sea Darwin as well. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Nat. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, anybody in the room? And if anybody online has questions, you can shout it out or um, put it in the chat. Anybody in the room? Um, is the ratio, you mentioned quite briefly the ratio between females and males. Is that like a normal thing? Um, you would expect to have more females than males naturally, um, but there, there has been a recorded decrease in males because of um, sand temperature rising and then um, turtles undergo temperature sex determination. So they're noticing a big feminization and I know in some populations like the Great Barrier Reef population that's going through to sub that out at each where they're seeing that at 98% fem, um, females. So yeah, we're expecting to see less and less males in the reefs. What? What would be the mating age for a male? For a male. Yeah, oh, we don't. Yeah, it's just the same as females. But um, yeah, I recently went earlier this year to a global what's it called, male sea turtle initiative workshop. Um, and um, that was one of the questions that came up. There was a, a long list of questions. We basically had to narrow down what we thought the priorities were. And that was one. <laughs> Yeah, how well does DNA survive di digestion? Um, well, because it's eDNA, so it's mm. you'd expect some of it to possibly get lost through 
digesting and they've done um, esophageal samples as well instead. But um, I know I spoke to the researchers that did, there's only been one study that's, that's done this and I spoke to them recently and um, they were using a metal scalpel handle to keep the turtle's mouths open and they snapped it in half. Um, that was one of the adults and they're mostly dealing with juveniles for that study. Um, so we decided safety wise that we'd just do the cloacal ones and, and see what we could get out of it. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah. I noticed in your videos, you um, when you were mapping the habitat, you had sound on. What what do you need sound for? Oh, um, that's just um, yeah, just the GoPro records sound. It's not really intentional. It's not use. Yeah, you're not, not you don't use yeah, it. Yeah, mm. it's not really good enough resolution to probably use it for the analysis. Yep, cool. You mean you forgot to turn the sound off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the thing about that last chapter with the threat mapping? You've got all the um, the sort of shipping movements, but what do you think about the risk from recreational boating as well? Because that's obviously probably much higher density, but in certain areas. Yes, yeah, much higher and people going really fast and people being drunk. Um, mm -hmm. But it's difficult to get data on that. So it's kind of where I've come up blank at the moment. I'd say it's, that's probably where much of the business drives is coming from. <laughs> yes, I did find um, at Jensen Bay at the Wessel Islands uh, a really rare species of fish, jellyfish. Um, so I, I found it in one of my transacts. I actually found about three of them in the end. Um, and I had no idea what it was. So I sent it to one of my supervisors who's a benthic expert and he didn't know what it was. So he sent it to a few colleagues and none of them knew what it was. They all gave me different suggestions and a deep dive on Google images told me that it was a benthic comb jelly. And there's been one recorded sighting in Australia at the Great Barrier Reef in the eighties. And that's it, yeah. Um, and that was just in five meters of water. So it kind of shows you how unstudied the marine life is in, out here.